This film deals with the tragic events of a previously secret story. The forcible repatriation of several million Russians by the Western governments to the Soviet regime. The sending of a great many innocent people to certain death or to Stalin's concentration camps. A diplomatic campaign that lasted from 1944 to 1947 and led to treachery, deceit, and the deaths of men, women, and children. A memorial cemetery by the town of Lienz in southern Austria for the victims of one of the clashes on the 1st of June, 1945. Nearby on this field, British soldiers, themselves deceived by their superiors, loaded thousands of Russian civilians into railway wagons at the point of a bayonet. I was absolutely shaken. I just hadn't realized that this sort of thing was going to happen at all. It was, uh, it, 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 it just appalled me. I couldn't understand what it, what it, what it was all in aid of. How can I say? I mean, uh, we were soldiers. Uh, the government's political, and uh, uh, I mean, there's the people that's running the, the whole show. We were only there to carry out their policies. To me, now looking back, it was purely political. That's what I take out of it. It was orders from as far as I can out now. It was orders from as high as you can go. And it was passed down. And we were there. Unfortunately, we were on the spot and we got the job. Even up to now, it's, it's haunted me and horrified me. Some nine years after this happened, I, I'd been having nightmares about this particular incident. And I had a rather bad nervous breakdown about it all. I would wake up in the night in this awful situation, I could see the suicides, I could see the people screaming at me to help them or to shoot them. And of course it did remain a secret with me until 30 years afterwards, a most unpleasant secret. At the time, and for almost 30 years after, the public knew next to nothing about the events. Most of the decisions were secret. Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago calls this act of betrayal truly the last secret, or one of the last, of the Second World War. There was absolutely no news of it at all, either in the uh, BBC broadcasts or uh, in the papers at home. In fact, I remember after the war, shortly after this, coming home and leave and telling people about it, and the general opinion here in this country was that it simply wasn't on, wasn't true, couldn't happen, because we didn't do that kind of thing. After the statutory 30 years, the documents are now available. This film is based on these, on a book by Nicholas Bethel, and on statements by those who took part in the events. But some of those who in one way or another were involved in bringing about the political decisions, Lord Avon, Anthony Eden, Sir Thomas Brimelow, Sir Patrick Dean, declined our invitation to appear in the program. I feel this is a story that has to be told. There must be a limit somewhere to man's inhumanity to man. You know, th there comes a time when uh, you can avoid rocking the boat only so much. Um, and to me, uh, there was always the feeling that a good deal of what we could have done in the purely humanitarian uh, way was not being done because there was a political boat to keep steady. May 1944. The western coastline of France. According to Western intelligence reports, large numbers of Russians under German command were manning the Atlantic Wall. June the 6th, 1944, D-Day. 
Nearly 10% of the enemy prisoners captured were Russian. They just sat and waited for things to happen, quite ready to surrender. Forced laborers, soldiers in all kinds of uniforms. Many of them were members of General Vlasov's Russian Liberation Army, men who joined the German army to fight against Stalin. The governments of the Western Allies must have realized the potential delicacy of the situation, must have realized that Stalin would probably want to have access to these sheep who had gone astray. The Red Army was still bearing the brunt of the war on the Eastern Front, and the Western Allies were anxious to do nothing that would offend the Soviet Union. We came across Russian prisoners brought to France by the Germans to do in forced labor. The bearded Ruski becomes the center of admiration. An American soldier tries to iron out a complication. He attempts by sign language and a self-concocted form of Esperanto to explain that, contrary to what these Russians and their wives have been told by the Germans, they are not going to be executed. These unfortunate people pressed into the German army labor gangs originally came from Orel. You can imagine what kind of a life they have led since they were taken on the Russian front and forced to work for the Nazis. The prisoners were ferried over in batches, most of them to Britain, many on to America. Special camps were constructed all over Britain. But only a few weeks after their capture, Patrick Dean, a legal advisor to the Foreign Office, wrote about the basic principle of keeping Soviet citizens in camps separate from the ordinary German prisoners of war. The Soviet embassy would then be asked to help in administering the camps and arranging for the people to return to the Soviet Union. They may have committed offenses under Soviet law, for example, treason. Although unwilling to hand over the Russians for the moment, the Foreign Office was careful to point out that it had no intention of protecting them. It merely wanted to wait a little. The effect of this would not be to deny the Soviet authorities the right to try and to punish their own nationals if they think fit, but merely to delay such steps being taken. This is purely a question for the Soviet authorities and does not concern His Majesty's government. In due course, all those with whom the Soviet authorities desire to deal must be handed over to them. And we are not concerned with the fact that they may be shot, or otherwise more harshly dealt with than they might be under English law. Signed, Patrick Dean. So, right from the beginning, it seemed to be accepted that the captured Russians must all be sent back because they belong to the Soviet authorities which meant, of course, to Stalin and Stalin's police, and that the Western governments had no right to deny this to their ally. A former campsite at Newlands Corner near London. The uh, hotel and its grounds were occupied by refugees, and then one weekend when I went down to stay with my old friend Mrs. Strachey at the house close next door, uh, she explained there was a most mysterious group of uh, people that they couldn't quite make out who they were and uh, I was allowed to go in and to talk to them fairly freely. They were a delightful set of people and behaving extremely well that they were terrified of going back to Russia. Some of them explicitly said that they feared immediate execution. Others, that they dreaded the labor camps. There were several thousand people who might just as well came from Mars. There were practically everybody there. I mean, all tribes and nations of Asia in the Caucasus were represented, and uh, they were glad that at the long last they are out of the shooting line, they are out of being pushed around. <laughs> 
they are being fed, they are being taken care of, they are being taken to the hospital. They consider themselves very lucky. The Daily Mirror. Yesterday I saw how the British Army authorities are trying to give each man back his confidence and how, in the words of the camp commandant, they entered here subdued and broken and daily are lifting their heads higher towards their independence. As I left, the commandant, an army major, told me of their almost religious respect for British uniform, which they treat as that of their heaven-sent liberators. They simply say the British have been kind to us. They have behaved extremely well to us and uh, we simply trust them. They, they, they can't be handing us over to death or torture. On July the 17th, 1944, the British War Cabinet agreed to hand them all back to the Soviet authorities as soon as shipping could be arranged. And on July the 20th, Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary, informed the Soviet ambassador about this. The policy of the United States was then adapted to fit this British initiative. The few thousand Russians now in Western hands were a cross-section of the great mass of people, the millions, to be repatriated in the course of the next few years. Who were these people? How did they find themselves in this situation? On June the 22nd, 1941, the German army invaded Russia. It quickly made huge territorial gains. The Nazis did not meet the staunch resistance from Soviet citizens that they might have expected. In the Ukraine, they were greeted as liberators. Many millions of Russians became prisoners of the Nazis. Some were genuinely loyal to the Soviet Union, but others felt a deep-rooted hatred for Stalin, Bolshevism, and the Soviet system. I'm a Red Army man. I was a Soviet soldier, even in wartime. But once I was taken prisoner, I no longer wanted to fight for Soviet power. My family were driven out of their home. They were doing away with the Kulaks, the private farmers. I'm a Kulak son. They took my father to Siberia. He died there three years later. British war documents tell of similar case histories. It was one long story of shootings, arrest, ill treatment and deportation. Kulak sons who had been chased from pillar to post. One young man stated that he had been in prison from the age of 12 until released to join the Red Army. There was a man who said that his father had been a priest who had first his tongue cut out to prevent him from preaching and had then been shot by the Soviet authorities. I wanted to fight against it. It wasn't the Russians I wanted to fight, but communism. Not only individuals, but whole groups of people took up arms on the German side. The Cossacks. Under the Tsars, they retained certain privileges and an independence that ended with the revolution of 1917. Their lands were redistributed, their traditional way of life eroded. The Cossacks wanted to re-establish their Cossack lands as they had been in 1918. They weren't fighting against the Russian people. They only fought against the Soviet power. There was little understanding of all this in the West. 
Westerners may have been aware of the repressions and the purges of the 1930s, but they had precious little idea of their extent. But mass deportations, terror and famine dominated the lives of millions of Russians. They came to believe that no man could be worse than the devil who governed them. To them, Hitler was an unknown quantity. They were glad to help him, and incautiously they threw themselves into battle on his side. We thought it better to help the external enemy, so that later we would be able to free ourselves from the internal enemy. Too late did they realize that by doing this, they had placed themselves beyond the pale, not only with Stalin, but also with the British and the Americans. To the decision makers in London and Washington, these men were in enemy uniform, traitors to the glorious Russian ally. But these voluntary collaborators were only a small group, probably no more than 15 to 20 percent of those to be repatriated. There was a much larger group of Soviet citizens who were forced to put on German uniforms. Hitler's attitude to the Russians was this. I'm not interested in these wild Caucasian nations. All I care about is their oil. From 1942, over two million Soviet citizens were brought to Germany by force to work in the German factories as slave labor. They too were to be liberated by the Western Allies. Soviet prisoners of war were treated similarly as subhuman slaves. From British war documents. Several times he was asked to work for the Germans, but he refused. Then a Major and General Vlasov's army came to the camp and offered him work in a labor battalion. He was told that if he did not accept the work, he would stay in the camp and starve. There were cases of cannibalism in these camps. From the Gulag Archipelago. People who have never starved as our war prisoners did, who have never gnawed on bats that happened to fly into the barracks, who've never had to boil the sole of their old shoes, will never understand the irresistible material force exerted by any kind of appeal, any kind of argument whatsoever, if behind it, on the other side of the camp gates, smoke rises from the field kitchen. And if everyone who signs up is fed a belly full of kasha right then and there, if only once, just once before I die, and hovering over the steaming kasha and the inducements of the recruiter was the apparition of freedom and a real life. Wherever it might call, to the Vlasov battalions, to the Cossack regiments of Krasnov, to the labor battalions, pouring cement into the future Atlantic Wall. Unsere Männer auf vielen Kriegsschauplätzen erprobte Soldaten sind in langer Wartezeit auf die Gegebenheiten des Kampfes vorbereitet worden. These, then, are the backgrounds to the people who were shipped to Britain and America. Even at this early stage, their fate already sealed. They were to be called a thorough nuisance, a source of embarrassment, a threat to the Grand Alliance. Next to no attempt was to be made to separate the innocent from the guilty. They were to be made collectively responsible, to be handed over or sent back, en masse, the lot, to the Soviet authorities. 
But on the 21st of July, 1944, Lord Selborne, a senior minister in charge of army intelligence, wrote a letter to the foreign secretary, Anthony Eaton. My dear Anthony, I am profoundly moved by the decision of the cabinet to send back to Russia all Russian subjects in the German army who fall into our hands on the battlefields of Europe. It will mean certain death to them. My officer has interviewed a number of these prisoners, and in every case their story is substantially the same. Forced into a German labor unit, they were given weapons and told they were now in the German army. None of them have any doubt that if they're sent back to Russia, they will be shot. And not only as alleged traitors, but also on the simple basis that they had actually fallen into German captivity. This was the official Soviet attitude, as interpreted by Stalin and his secret police. Lord Salborn, they recall that Stalin has explicitly stated, Russia acknowledges no prisoners of war. Russia has only soldiers in her army, dead soldiers or traitors. They have been told that they should always keep the last bullet for themselves and kill themselves rather than fall into the hands of the Germans. Solzhenitsyn. The only soldier in the world who cannot surrender is the soldier of the world's one and only Red Army. That is what it says in our military statutes. There was something called Article 58 1B, and in wartime it provided only for execution by shooting. For not wanting to die from a German bullet, the prisoner had to die from a Soviet bullet for having been a prisoner of war. A prisoner of war was also a security risk, an extra witness to humiliating defeats, someone who had seen the world outside the Soviet Union. The forced laborers, the civilian deportees, they saw the comparative affluence in which German people lived even during wartime. Should we return, we would be an embarrassment to our government. We were told that in Russia, the lot of workers was better than in any country in the world. Since we have been taken prisoner, we know there is a higher standard of life in France, in Belgium, in Norway for the workers than in Russia. Stalin would never be able to have us back. The stigma of traitor attached to us would never be removed. They were tainted with the Western brush. Stalin wanted to get away all those subjects of the Soviet Union who came into contact with the West. They didn't want to have them inside Russia without, uh, well, uh, without reindoctrination, if you wish, or without elimination. Solzhenitsyn. That spring of 1945 was, in our prisons, predominantly the spring of the Russian prisoners of war. They passed through the prisons of the Soviet Union in vast, dense, grey shoals like ocean herring. What happened in Siberia? I went hungry, that's what. That's how it is in Siberia. You don't have a name, you're just a number. The hardest time of all was in 48, 49 and 50. We called it starvation time. At our Larkpunkt, a Larkpunkt is a unit of about 1,200 people. Between 120 and 150 people used to die every day. A fresh batch had to be brought in every 10 days or so because so many people died. By the time the ten days were up, there was no one left to fell the trees. But the state plan still had to be fulfilled. Evidence in Lord Selborne's letter alone must have made it clear that these Russians were eligible for the traditional Western principle of political asylum. It was in the knowledge of the kind of fate that was awaiting people like them that civilized countries conceived the idea of political asylum. <laughs>
Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the tempest tossed, to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. As soon as Eden received Lord Selborne's letter, he scribbled a note to his officials in the Foreign Office. What do you say to all this? It doesn't deal with the point. If these men don't go back to Russia, where are they to go? We don't want them here. Prime Minister Churchill's initial reaction to Selborne's letter was sympathetic. He wrote to Eden. I think we dealt rather summarily with this at Cabinet, and the point put by the Minister of Economic Warfare should certainly be reconsidered. Even if we are somewhat compromised, all the apparatus of delay may be used. I think these men were tried beyond their strength. Eden wrote back to Churchill on August the 2nd. I have considered this difficult question more than once recently. But he had come to the firm conclusion that it was vital to let the original decision stand and send all the Russians back. They were captured while serving in German military or paramilitary formations, the behavior of which in France has often been revolting. We cannot afford to be sentimental about this. He recognized that there is the probability that if we do as the Soviet government want and return all these prisoners to the Soviet Union, whether they are willing to return or no, we shall be sending some of them to their death. But we cannot deny our allies the right to deal with their own nationals in their own way. The final argument in Eden's letter was, in the context, the most compelling and valid one. There were, he pointed out, large numbers of British and American prisoners of war held in eastern Germany and Poland. The Red Army was advancing quickly towards these areas, and it would be they who would shortly overrun and release them. It is most important that they should be well cared for and returned as soon as possible. For this, we must rely to a great extent upon Soviet goodwill. And if we make difficulty over returning to them their own nationals, I feel sure it will reflect adversely on their willingness to help in restoring to us, as soon as possible, our own prisoners. But was there any reasonable ground or actual evidence to support this thinking? I personally believe that had we persisted and taken a tough line, we and the Americans, that we would have got away with it. Uh, my experience later with the Russians has, has um, uh, convinced me that there's only one thing the Russians understand, and that is somebody who is not only tough, but who is proposed to stand by what he says. If you do that, they will usually come around to your way of thinking. If you don't stand up to them, they despise you and trample on you even harder. And I believe that a tough line would have saved many, many thousands of these Russians. The Secretary of State for War, P.J. Grigg, expressed his own fears in a critical letter to Eden. We are in an obvious dilemma, but I am not at all convinced that whatever we do, the Russians will go out of their way to send our prisoners westward at once, or to deal with them in any special manner. On the weight of Grigg's letter, Prime Minister Churchill decided to put the matter before the cabinet again. Anthony Eden was asked to prepare a cabinet paper. It is worth remembering that the Soviet Union was not a member of the Geneva Convention, and therefore her prisoners of war could not receive any aid through the International Red Cross. These are photographs of our prisoners in Nazi captivity. Our people wanted to come back. Theirs didn't. They knew that uh, 
it was unlike our own prisoners. They knew that they were going back to, uh, to what? At best, uh, a concentration camp. Our own people, this was a different story. They, they were dying to get back because uh, what happened to our prisoners of war when they finally got back to England? They were welcomed as heroes. These people were not heroes, they were martyrs. I've looked into the documents as carefully as I can, and I haven't been able to find any documents that show that British or American lives would really have been put in danger if we'd refused to send all the Russians back. It could be that something was said verbally, in which case Anthony Eden would know about it. I've asked him whether there is any evidence which I don't know about, but apart from saying that it was fear for British and American prisoners' lives that prompted him to agree to this policy, he has declined to go into details either for my book or for this film. I only wish that he would change his mind and explain exactly why it was that this decision was taken. There can be no doubt that it was Anthony Eden who pushed the policy through Cabinet. Other ministers were reluctant, they expressed their reluctance in memoranda, but it was Eden's strong arguments that carried the policy through. Eden also set the tone for the implementation of the policy and turned it into a, a very servile approach to the Soviet Union and he didn't seem to understand the suffering and the horror that these people had been through. He didn't seem to be touched by their plight in any human way and it was his remarks that led to the implementation of the policy in a much less sympathetic way than could otherwise have been and led to its broadening from soldiers to women and children and to involving in the end several millions of people many of whom had not collaborated with the Germans at all. On the basis of Eden's cabinet paper of September the 3rd a war cabinet of seven after a short discussion officially approved the policy of repatriation. A few weeks later the United States where up to then certain mitigating regulations existed decided to conform to the more rigid British line. In the many camps across the country, the Russian prisoners were growing restless. And when I went down for my usual visit, there they were in a condition of the most appalling misery and gloom. And not only that, there was evidently, perfectly clearly, uh, the great shock that the British really had done the worst, which they thought would never happen. And instead of being our amiable friends and acquaintances, they wouldn't even look at us. They kept their eyes on the ground. Why did Eden feel it necessary to suggest, from a difficult choice of priorities, what may have seemed the politically expedient solution instead of the humanitarian one. Concern about our own prisoners of war cannot have been the only explanation. There might well have been other considerations as well. The inconvenience of having to resettle several million people, for instance. The refugee then and in the immediate post-war years was regarded as a headache, an inconvenience. As Eden said, we may be saddled with them permanently to our great embarrassment. The refugee was a pawn in a gigantic international power game. In late 1944, it may not have seemed out of place to sacrifice a certain number of prisoners of war in an attempt to establish a working relationship with the Soviet Union for a vision of a post-war grand alliance. The Foreign Office's official view was this. These people seem to us to deserve no sympathy and we think our principal aim where they are concerned should be to ensure that they cause no trouble between us and the Soviet authorities over here. John R. Dean, 
the senior American military officer who negotiated the refugee question at Yalta. Even more important than the physical well-being of a few liberated American prisoners was the opportunity to build up goodwill between the United States and the Soviet Union. If pictorial evidence of the Soviet army's colossal blows against the Germans be needed, then what more striking proof can we bring than these pictures just received from Russia? At the time, one had a very different view of Russia to the one one has now, and it is very easy to look at it retrospectively. But with the churning out of propaganda about Russia and all the stuff of the 1930s with the intellectuals, Bernard Shaw, and uh, John Strachey, who built up an extremely favorable picture of Russia. Naturally, at the end of the war, all that we did at Ma, the Russian military machine, fantastically, but one naively imagined it was backed up by an ideal socialist state, because this is what we'd been led to believe. The climate of opinion in Britain was such that the Russians could do nothing wrong. I mean, uh, good old Uncle Joe was uh, hailed in cartoons and the whole press were for the Russians. Indeed, it seemed that the Russians have saved the West. From Russia today, there come the repeated notes of victory. With each brilliant success, Marshal Stalin issues an order of the day, and from the Red Square Moscow, the salvos of guns crash out their triumphant message. The victories of Stalingrad, Rostov and Kharkov are avenging them. We applaud these glorious feats of arms. We look forward to the victories that are to come to the final victory that will be won together. And there were people who uh, had a most romantic attitude to the uh, Russians. And the number of the terrible and dreadful things that Russia had done were not so very well known. This is what we had been led to believe about this ideal socialist state, which we know now at that time was the biggest tyranny in the world, and that millions of Russians had been slaughtered in the purge which preceded the war. Evidence suggests that Eden had a real liking for Stalin. I've met him many times during the war. I went there in 1941, and I was much impressed with Stalin. I always have been uh, in his qualities as a negotiator. When Churchill and Eden visited Stalin in October 1944, and the idea of the exchange of prisoners was discussed briefly over dinner, Eden was impressed and talked about Marshal Stalin's satisfactory assurance. He later said that Stalin has never broken his word, once given. But you not on this trick of uh, negotiating paper, never. But you know, somebody who knew uh, workings of the communist mind in Russia and the world, and the fancy it was, that once said to me, uh, one is always a Stalinist here. And uh, I begin to think that the only way to work it out is to think what I expect the communist Russia to do, and then guess to do the opposite. <laughs> but well, something in it, something. But in this case, it was all sadly predictable. 
Soviet military authorities, invited by our government, took over the initiative and the management of the Russian prisoners in British camps. Now there was no way out of the agreement, no hope for delaying tactics. In fact, the problem had become a joint one for the Soviet and the British governments. And we must not provide them with a grievance which they will regard as unreasonable. The correct relations had to be kept at all costs. We had conferences where I acted not as a liaison officer but as an interpreter. And uh, there was absolutely no way in which I could interpret some of the replies where either the British or the Russians, on the one hand or the other, uh, would come back at each other in, in the rudest, in the most crude fashion at times. As an interpreter, I couldn't pass this on. Right in the back of my mind was, keep the thing as smooth as possible. Keep them talking. As long as we're talking, there's yet hope. At the insistence of the Soviet authorities, the Russians were discharged from their prisoner of war status and were now under the category of ordinary Soviet citizens under the command of Soviet officers. And this rule was then made applicable also to Russian civilians. The Allied Forces Act was interpreted in such a way as to include civilian deportees and slave laborers liberated from the various Nazi labor camps. The Soviet government wanted them back too and to isolate them as security risks from the rest of the population. The Stalin regime considers all the people are traitors who happen to be in Germany somehow or another, whether it's by force or whether it's willingly or whatever, you are still considered to be a traitor. And I, I, I felt so bad because at 16 and a half years of age, you really, you can't be a traitor because you don't know sufficiently enough of the politics to be a traitor. Stalin lumped together, en masse, the innocent and the guilty. But did we do very much better? There was virtually no effort made on our side to deal with these people as individuals. General Sir Horatius Murray is one who did interpret the repatriation order in a personal way, thereby making it possible for at least 1,500 Russians to escape. Because I, I refuse to deal with soldiers of any nationality in the mass. And that's as, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's part of our training is that each man matters. And when I looked at this lot, and when I thought that it might easily be composed of, of uh, Soviet citizens, emigres from Paris, uh, others who had been forced to put on uniform by the Germans at pistol point, I thought, no, you don't. And so I personally, on my level, gave them all the benefit of the doubt and there, anybody stayed behind, stayed behind at their own risk. At the time, practically no attempt was made on any level to filter all these prisoners of war to establish exactly what their backgrounds were. The sole official effort was a joint British-Soviet commission headed by Brigadier Firebrace, who died only recently. It was possible for him to save a few lives through a single legal loophole. But the case histories he heard moved him so much that he wrote a critical letter to his superiors. His protest was put aside. Look here, I was in the army. I don't know if you've been in the army. In the army, you do what you're told. Colonel C.H. Tamplin took part at the hearings of the Firebrace Committee. We thoroughly in human thing, but we were told to do it, and we therefore did it. And it made no difference if I cleared out; they put another fellow in, and he'd, he'd get the same job. In the camps, the mood was desperate. Soldiers committed suicide rather than face being returned to Russia. Well, they, they cut their wrists. That's the usual thing. They cut their throats. That's another way. They cut themselves, bled like pigs all over the place. But I don't blame them, poor devils. One man had gone to the bathroom and uh, just took his belt off and hanged himself. We finally, uh, we found him and we cut him down and uh, 
Uh, there's an odd incident connected with that. I came home shortly after that trip, and my my wife had taken a teddy bear that my little daughter had and had, had to wash it because it got very dirty and had it hanging up on the clothesline, but she had it hanging by the neck. And she laughs to this day of, at the way I came home and uh, cut the thing down, <laughs> hung it by a foot. <laughs> I, I, um, these things leave a very strong impression on you. And uh, there were other suicides as well. And they, they all did go to the highest level to our office. They got to the foreign office. And uh, we were simply told that uh, you get on with the job. There will be a few like this. I, I feel that we knew perfectly well at that stage, uh, well before Yalta, that uh, this situation existed. We, we knew that uh, these people hadn't much hope once they got back. To the Big Three conference in the Crimea went not only the leaders of the three great Allied powers, but also the hopes and faith of all men who look to a future free from war. The decisions reached here have to square up to the bedrock aspirations of the people of the United Nations and prove worthy of their cause. At the conference at Yalta, a three-power subcommittee formalized the matter of repatriation in a written agreement. All Soviet citizens liberated by Allied armies will, after their liberation, be separated from German prisoners of war until they are handed to the Soviet authorities. Marshal Stalin hoped they could be sent to Russia as quickly as possible. Those who had agreed to fight for the Germans could be dealt with on their return to Russia. Alexander Kadagan, permanent secretary at the Foreign Office, wrote to his wife on February the 11th. I have never known the Russians so easy and accommodating. In particular, Joe has been extremely good. He's a great man and shows up very impressively against the background of the other two aging statesmen. I think the conference has been quite successful. Roughly at the same time as the Yalta conference, three British ships took the first 7,000 Soviet prisoners to Odessa. An eyewitness account of events at Odessa Harbor. The situation was very unpleasant. We had to unload them. Well, of course, the NKVD troops arrived immediately on board, and they were taking them in batches. Well, we accompanied them on, uh, on the shore. We checked that. And some of them were segregated, some of them were um, uh, taken away immediately, and some were left huddled on the, on the quayside. Well, and uh, I had two uh, salvers of machine guns. There were three huge sheds, and uh, in the middle shed, I had the machine guns. Well, I didn't think they were just practicing machine guns in the middle shed, because I never saw those men again. The three great leaders and their staffs of military and political advisors face the inevitable battery of cameras. Through five and a half years of war, we have long awaited this moment of the Churchill-Roosevelt-Stalin meeting, the Grand Alliance. After signing the repatriation agreement at Yalta, all three parties thought it wiser to keep parts of the agreement secret. Stalin, this matter has formed no part of the confidence. It should not be included in the report. The White House revealed that there was an agreement, but made it seem about prisoners' welfare, nothing more. In London, the Foreign Office stipulated, it is most important to note that this agreement and exchange of notes is secret. Signed, Patrick Dean. When in 1947 the Foreign Office was asked whether the United Nations should know about the agreement, 
The reply was, strong objection. This agreement must remain secret. It was signed by a junior official, Thomas Brimelow, now Sir Thomas Brimelow, KCMG. Until the end of 1975, permanent Under Secretary of State at the Foreign Office and head of the Diplomatic Corps. The secrecy surrounding the true nature of the agreement and the tragic events that were to follow was painstakingly and on the whole very successfully observed for almost 30 years. If the papers as they do today have revealed the incident to the British public, I am sure it would be a public outcry and the British people would stop the politician of playing up to that degree as to sending innocent people to their deaths. The public in Britain and America was, in fact, told about mutual repatriation. A communique was published after Yalta, but it described a wholly peaceful and desirable event. There was no mention or indication of anything done by force. No one took any notice. But some little news of the real nature of the secret agreement did in fact leak to the press. The New York Times, May 1945. At the Yalta conference, it was apparently decided that all pre-1939 Russians should accordingly be sent back to Russia. Now they are being repatriated despite the unwillingness of many. The London Daily Herald, May 1945. All Russian subjects will be compulsorily returned, whether they wish it or not. But even then, no one took much notice. The British people always look on the best of other people, and they find it very difficult to understand that there are places and peoples who really dislike each other intensely. I don't think they care a who. I don't believe they, they were prepared to get interested in somebody else's problems when they've been fighting themselves for six years. But we'll find peace at last and live in sweet repose. Then your tears won't be in vain, my lovely Russian rose. On the 23rd of May, 1945, another ship left for Odessa, the Empire Pride. Captain Yumatov witnessed the loading at Liverpool Harbour. They were under extremely heavy guard. There were two guards to every prisoner, which was a pretty heavy proportion. Uh, the captain of the ship wasn't too happy because the, the, uh, the brig had been repainted uh, just to freshen up the ship a little bit. And I don't think that the paint was fully dry. It was still tacky. One of them, uh, as we were walking along, the, the docks at Liverpool are, uh, were sort of a cobbled uh, thing at the time. He took his china mug, uh, which they all carried, uh, a tea mug, a large china tea mug, smashed it on the cobbles and proceeded to cut his throat. And uh, he did a very efficient job of it, he, because he cut himself in a jagged line from there to there. Uh, we got to him as quickly as possible to stop any, any bad bleeding and um, promptly made arrangements because we had all kinds of people on the dock that were assisting us uh, to have him rushed off to a hospital in Liverpool to uh, have the throat stitched and have him hospitalized until he was uh, well again. Uh, the Russians wouldn't have this, and uh, I might say that uh, General Ratov was there himself at the time, and he said that the, absolutely not, that the, the man was on the manifest, and uh, since he was on the manifest, he had to be put on the ship. So we got a, one of the doctors that were on the docks to, to stitch him up as best he could, and he was literally dragged to the cells, uh, on his way to his cells, uh, through the simple expedient of closing his mouth and, and straining. He, he managed to burst open the stitching. It was re-stitched. We got him in, and uh, the only way that they could possibly uh, handle him was to uh, 
strip him of all his clothing because it, apparently they didn't want him to commit suicide. Strip him of his clothing, uh, tie his hands to uh, one of the iron bedposts, uh, you know, they had these uh, three-decker bunks in the brig, uh, tie his hands to one of these and um, leave him to it. I'm afraid that the, the uh, I still have the occasional nightmare uh, which involves red and green. The, the, the brig was painted a light green and uh, it was tacky and the blood was red and it was tacky and the, the two combined and uh, by this time both the prisoner and the cell were just literally splattered and mottled with this red and green combination. 31 prisoners, including the one who attempted suicide, were executed on arrival in Odessa. About the events at Liverpool Harbour, official secrecy was ordered. Roughly at the same time, in the spring of 1945, about 35,000 Cossacks arrived at the valley of the River Drau in southern Austria. The area was occupied by the British 5th Corps and the 8th Battalion Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. Soldiers who had been through a great many battles and were now enjoying an easier time as the war in Europe was over. Cossack troops had, by choice, collaborated with the Nazis and were now in the last phase of a long retreat from Russia. With them were their families, their elders, and many thousands of civilians, mainly women and children, who attached themselves to the group during its retreat across the Balkans and Italy. Well, it was the most unusual army you could ever hope to meet. They didn't look militants. Uh, there was no regular uniforms. They were traveling in these covered wagons, the same type of wagon you see in the old West films, with the canvas hooded tops. And uh, they were accompanied by their wives, their sweethearts, their children, the camp followers, the priests, and it was just a regular tackle army. Something you felt more like the Napoleonic Wars, cooking pots and uh, tents and whole families on the move. One covered wagon held a family, uh, mainly women and children as far as we could see, with about one man amongst them. But whole bottom of valleys seemed to be covered with these uh, Cossacks. On May the 8th, the Cossacks contacted British officers and offered to surrender unconditionally. Oh, they were delighted to see us. And uh, on the way down the road, we met them and invited them to disarm, which they did without any question, and threw their arms out on the side of the road. They came streaming down the road, and they were all on horses, and the bands were playing. You'd have thought they were going on manoeuvres or something. Oh, they were delighted to see us. And... Uh, on the way down the road, we met them and invited them to disarm, which they did without any question, and threw their arms out on the side of the road. They came streaming down the road, and they were all on horses, and the bands were playing. You'd have thought they were going on manoeuvres or something. They were rather relieved, I think, that the war was over and that they had surrendered to the British Army. We believed totally in the Western forces. We believed in them as the defenders of Western democracy. It did not enter our heads that we, active fighters against communism, should be given into the hands of the communists. And that was why the events elsewhere came as a very great shock to them. 
they believed implicitly in the word of an Englishman. And therefore, you see, when I said, you disarm and move off over there, no trouble at all. A great mass of refugees from all over Europe found themselves in the Drow Valley. In point of fact, at my division headquarters where I was the liaison officer, I had to keep a check each day of the different types of prisoners in the divisional area. I had a big blackboard and I had all sorts of nationalities and it used to be a standing joke that everybody was there except a Chinaman. And yet one night when we got the situation reports in from the battalion, lo and behold, one Chinaman turned up. <laughs> The Cossacks settled down in a camp near the town of Lienz. This was an entire community. 15,000 men, 4,000 women, and 2,500 children. It was just one of the many Cossack groups under British command. They were just about the oddest thing we'd ever seen. I remember the first time we ever met them. And there was this big headquarters tent. And outside the tent there were about 30 or 40 Cossacks doing the sort of tricks with horses that you see in a circus. It was quite, quite unreal to us. We, we, we hadn't seen it before. Um, they seemed happy. They seemed healthy. At that particular time, they, they didn't seem to have a care in the world. They would uh, put on exhibitions with their horses, sometimes bareback riding picking up handkerchiefs at a full gallop and uh, dancing in the saddle of the horse at a gallop. Oh, they were just sheer brilliant. It really was wonderful. I think even the mountains sang because the war was over. And then I noticed the barracks in the distance. It looked an enormous place, as though it was some kind of forgotten fortress. There were different uniforms, there were civilians, there were a lot of young people, old women and children, and I walked straight into the camp. And um, I ran along um, the road, throwing my arms in left and right and into the air, then we... Um, in fact, I fell down onto the, onto the ground. I was so happy to, to just be there, because I knew that I, I, I no longer had to hide from anyone. Between the Cossacks and the British officers, there was a friendly relationship. The officer directly responsible for the Cossacks, Major Rusty Davis, was especially trusted and respected. None of the British officers knew as yet about the repatriation order. Oh yes, they uh, had every faith in the British. Um, they always asked us what was going to happen to them, and we explained, we were told in fact that they were prisoners of the British and uh, as such would be treated. Their one dread, of course, was to be, to go back to Russia. And this was the question you know, three or four times every day. You, you won't send us back to Russia. And our reply quite seriously was no, of course we shan't. Because our orders were quite clear that they were our prisoners and would be treated as such and would not be handed over to the Russians. I remember one day the, this young interpreter came up to me and he said, I hear we are going to be handed back to the Russians. And now our automatic response to that was rubbish. We, we simply don't believe it. On the 24th of May, through the commander of the British V Corps, Lieutenant General Charles Keatley, came the order that every one of the Cossacks, man, woman and child, was to be handed back to the Soviet authorities, irrespective of their individual wishes and by force if necessary. On May the 26th, the commander, Brigadier Geoffrey Masson, gave instructions to his battalion commanders for the forcible delivery of the Cossacks. A detailed plan was drawn up describing how this operation was to be carried out. The plan called not only for the use of violence, but also for the use of deceit. The first phase of the plan was to remove the Cossack officers to a separate place by a trick. For Rusty Davis, this meant betraying people who had implicit faith in him. He asked to be relieved, 
but was told that he had to carry on and do his duty because he was so much trusted by the Cossacks. So Davis told the Cossack officers that all 1,500 of them would be taken to a conference where the future of the Cossack community was to be decided. Though the announcement caused some consternation among the Cossacks, they believed it. Rusty Davis gave one of them his word of honor as an officer that they would return. When the officers began to board the English cars, one young officer said, gentlemen, look, this is a trap. Then a former Tsarist colonel got up and said, Gentlemen, we know that the officer of the Royal English Army gave us his word of honor, and a king's officer's word of honor is sacred for us. The officers exchanged glances and continued boarding the cars. An English officer's word of honor was enough. When the time came, the, the officers were loaded into the trucks. Um, the wi their wives and the children and all the other family who were living amongst them in the barracks, standing by little paths, waving goodbye to them. And they were all crying. And then the father tried to comfort the family by saying, we'll be back tomorrow, we'll see you tomorrow. And so they went off. As soon as the officers were on their way, Brigadier Geoffrey Musson's orders were forwarded to the ordinary soldiers. In accordance with an agreement made by the Allied government, the Cossacks now in the area will be returned to Russia. This will be an extremely difficult task, particularly as there are so many women and children, some of you will feel sympathetic toward these people. But you must remember that they took up arms for the Germans. The Russians have said that they intend to put these people to work on the land and to educate them to be decent Soviet citizens. There is no indication whatever that there will be a massacre of these people. We were completely unaware of what was to be the fate of these wretched people. There are all sorts of rumors that went about. But really, I think we were first faced with the facts when the officers were removed by a trick, and a very dirty one, too. I think it was disgusting, quite frankly. I mean, after all, this is the kind of thing the Germans did. It wasn't the kind of thing that we should have done. We had been telling the soldiers for years that we were fighting for democracy, we were fighting for fair play, we were fighting uh, for all the reasonable, decent things in life. We told them that when you had defeated your enemy, you should be magnanimous. I think that was one of Churchill's precepts. The convoy of the officers arrived at the barracks of the small town of Spital and were driven into a barbed wire enclosure. There, the senior British officer told the Cossacks that next morning at dawn, they'd be taken to the zonal boundary at Judenburg and handed over to the Soviet authorities. Lieutenant Tom Dennis. They were pressing to the wire and bearing the chests and asking us to shoot them. They asked me to bring their wives and children to them and shoot them. Some said, please let us escape, um, but of course we couldn't do any of these things. And as the evening progressed, they asked me to get a, a priest and they set up an altar and started this service, which went on all through the night. Very calm night and um, a sort of candlelit altar and the priest in all his robes. The Cossacks kneeling round and praying and they were singing hymns and chants. This went on all through the night. Occasions when we saw Cossacks come out of the wooden barrack huts and bring out what we thought were bodies, carry dead persons out and lie, lie them on the grass at the side of the huts. A horrifying night, it really was. And the service continued until uh, the trucks arrived at half past four, when we had to start loading them up onto the transport. 
And this is when uh, the trouble really began because the Cossacks refused to load and a lot of force had to be used to, to make them load. Um, it really was ghastly. Um, we tried to open the first barrack hut and couldn't open the doors. The troops were given orders to smash the door down and we found the Cossack hanging behind the door. He'd hanged himself with some electric light flex from the roof of the building. Others had cut their wrists with broken glass and their throats with broken glass. And, of course, all the time, this forceful loading of carrying, uh, screaming, resisting men. A tough job for the infantry to do. Uh, I appealed to them to make it easy. I said, we've got our orders now as soldiers, and we're going to carry it out. Please make it as easy as possible, both for you and for us. And so this went on. Um, some walked uh, with a sort of resignation to the trucks. Others had to be carried. The, there were some quite old men, elderly men, it must have been in the 70s, who lay on the ground, they were paralyzed with fright and had to be carried. The younger Cossacks carried them in. And finally, the young Cossacks jumped in the trucks and started singing the Cossack patrol. They really sang beautifully as, uh, as they went out of the gates. And it, it haunted me, this singing. This, I thought, was tremendous courage. The bridge at Judenburg, where the officers were handed over. The zonal boundary was at the middle of the bridge. During the handover, there were two documented suicides. A man cut his throat with a razor blade. Another threw himself from the bridge to the rocks below. The officers were seen to be taken to a nearby factory building where they disappeared from sight. With the officers removed by a trick, it was now possible to reveal to the Cossack rank and file in Lienz the non-commissioned officers, private soldiers, priests, civilian refugees, women and children, that they would be handed back on the 1st of June. The Cossacks declared a hunger strike. They put out black flags. They painted signboards. And on the morning of the day, about 4,000 people assembled in a central square for a huge religious service. I remember that morning so vividly. It was lovely and sunny, and uh, the sun was shining on the square when we were all gathering for the prayers. The crowd, immensely thick, all over the place. We were all out from the barracks into the square. It's sort of a carnival mood, one would call it, with different flags and colorful scenes all over the place, people getting together. On the outside of the crowd, cadets formed themselves into a protective chain. We were very, very close together, the crowd held each other arm in arm, children, mother, grandmothers, um, men, young women and young boys, all together. The British troops under Rusty Davis arrived. With them, the trucks, which were to ferry the Cossacks to the railway line a few hundred yards away, where a train consisting of about 30 goods wagons was already waiting. And there was a great deal of noise and distress. Uh, the soldiers were standing round uh, in obviously in a situation they couldn't cope with. Uh, I felt the officers were up against something that they both deplored and didn't know how to deal with. I mean in the army you're just told to do a thing, you never questioned them. You carried out your job as you were told to do it. And then it was decided after a while that some of the troops had to pick off a corner of the square or a corner of the circle to try and get them to move. There was no other way of moving. Pleading with them was no use. The high priest seemed to be in complete charge of the situation. 
and uh, nothing was moving, wailing and singing. And we'll, we went in to this, and as we went in, of course, the whole circle went in, and the whole centre just went up, just like a cone right up in there. Of course, they were screaming, people were being trampled. And True. Noise, hysteria yes. broke out. Hysterica. Women were screaming, children crying. A nightmare had begun. It was a panic. There was absolute turmoil. One didn't know where to run and what to do. There were quite a few children killed in that crowd and elderly people. Yes, the, when the first coroner was to go off and put away the, the train, there were uh, maybe six men lying smothered. But it was with themselves, thrown with themselves, and the top of one another, it smothered them. I was crashed against the barrack, and uh, my half of my body was on one side of the barrack, on the jagged glass of the window, and the other, my head and shoulders, on the other side. And my knees were dangling, and the crowd kept pushing it against the barrack, as it were. The English soldiers began to use sticks. Those standing at the back were beaten and thrown into the lorries. It's certainly not a job that should have been given to any battalion to do. It's, it's not, not, not for a British soldier, not for that, I would have said, not for any soldier. I saw some of the English soldiers turning their heads away and crying, as I am crying now. Oh, they were deeply moved by the events. They were soldiers and they were asked to do an unsoldierly act. They, did, they were not men who were afraid of danger at all, but they were afraid of a thing like this, where no one could strike back. This was not what they were trained to do. And it was an offence to, to their ideas of human decency. I don't think many British soldiers really knew why the, the war was being fought, but they did understand that it was for human decency so that men and women would not be treated as cattle ever again. At a woodland glade, a man shot his wife and three children and then killed himself. Mothers were murdering their own children, throwing them off the bridge into the river Drow and then jumping themselves into the water. I saw a Cossack mother, she was wearing a cloak and she pulled out a, a bundle of clothes from under her cloak and struck it on the bridge. I realised it was a child she was hitting on the bridge and then she grabbed the child in her arms and jumped over the bridge and was swept away in the river. Two or three more did the same thing with children possibly four or five years of age. And that's a horrifying sight for anyone to see. The many thousands of soldiers and civilians who were loaded into the goods wagons were taken to Judenburg to be handed over. Lieutenant Owen Frampton inspected the trains before they were sent over to the Russian-occupied zone. And this is where I began to realize that things weren't as far as I was concerned, right. The, many of the windows were broken in the train. And the carriage that I walked through, first of all, was just a mass of blood. You could see where the bodies had been dragged down the, the corridor in the train and even down the steps of the train itself. Um, the toilets were just a terrible mess. And I just didn't know, I was appalled. I just didn't know what, what had happened at all. And then I was told by the soldiers, some of the soldiers, that many of the Cossacks had committed suicide on the train. And uh, especially any of the officers that were there, or the non-commissioned officers had committed suicide. And they, 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 their families had been killed as well on the train. Well, it was most horrible in some cases. Um, I can distinctly remember somebody, well, more than one, had cut their throats with a piece of barbed wire. Possibly they must have got it off the carriage where the 
I'll say there was barbed wire across the grill of the carriage, of the truck. Uh, somehow or the other, they must have got a piece off and used it to cut their own throats. Others were strangled with twisted neck scarves. It must have been done with the assistance or the connivance of somebody else in the truck. And um, I realized then that this was a forced repatriation. This was the first time that I'd realized it was a forced repatriation. And I reported back to my regiment and immediately asked to be removed from the detail. But the Western public knew nothing or precious little of all these events. The general turn was this. The Times, 6th of July, 1945. All had but one goal, to get home. Daily Herald, 6th of September, 1945. I found wagons chalked with greetings in Russian. Long live our motherland, and glory to the father of our victories, the great Stalin. No one seems reluctant to be going back to Russia. They are smiling, laughing. They sing to the accompaniment of an accordion. A mandolin is twanging too. In mid-January 1946, a ferocious mass suicide of Russians resisting repatriation at Dachau, the site of the former Nazi concentration camp, ending in bloodbath. Eventually, eventually, there may come. I feel eventually there will come the principle of common citizenship. A few weeks later, on March the 5th, 1946, Winston Churchill made his famous speech at Fulton, Missouri. A shadow had fallen upon the scenes so lately lightened, lighted by the Allied victory. Uh, no, no, nobody knows what Soviet Russia and its communist international organization intends to do in the immediate future. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line, by all the capitals... The Cold War had begun. The Soviet Union did not seem to honor many of her commitments at Yalta. There were no free elections in Poland. She made difficulties in returning the Western prisoners of war. It was all in vain, after all. And yet the British Labour Cabinet and the United States still felt obliged to carry out further elaborate acts of repatriation with a great many casualties to preserve the semblance of an empty treaty. Only as late as June 1947, after being in existence for three years, did the policy finally fade away. It was then denounced in Parliament as abhorrent to this country and disappeared without much fuss. But by that time, millions of people had become its victims, killed, deported, lost in Siberia. For more than two decades, these survivors of the Lienz clash, gathering every year on the 1st of June, have been the only reminders of those events. And nearly 30 years had to pass before the facts became widely known. 
This film has elaborated on only two or three main areas of the many interwoven events of this story because they reflect the complex dilemmas, controversies, contradictions, and the tragic bitterness of these events. Despite the fact that the British public were for years kept in ignorance of the events, Solzhenitsyn, in a recent BBC interview, was uncompromising in his castigation. Britain is not a totalitarian country. In Britain, democracy is well established. There is the right to demand explanations, to ask questions. And yet 30 years have passed, and it is only now that with great difficulty, this secret is being unearthed. Well then, if the citizens of a totalitarian state are responsible for the actions of their governments, are the citizens of the most free, the most democratic parliamentary state not equally responsible? Yes, it may be that the orders were given by Churchill, that a certain number of senior officers carried them out. But public opinion did not prevent it, did not take the matter up, did not ask for explanations. And watching it all happening, we do get the feeling that the entire British nation has committed a sin because it has not repented for it, has not investigated it, has not renounced it, and has not tried to put it right.